The first thing I wanted to ask, ask you about, uh, Stuart, given that you know just the recent launch of uh, the sort of pictorial photographic history of Black Britain yes. at Rivington Place, yeah. that magnificent building, yeah. and your involvement. The thing that really caught my imagination is that the name of the library, as I said to you already, yes. is the Stuart Hall Yes, library. it's a very nice gesture of theirs, really. The name is after me, a very nice gesture. Um, so I'm very pleased. Have you been into it? I have. It's a wonderful room. It's one of the best rooms in the building. It's yeah. all those windows. And it yeah. really is spectacular. Yeah. And it's a very good library, you know, yeah. for its size and so on. Yeah. So I'm very, very pleased with that association. Yeah. I've always thought of libraries as a kind of place of refuge, really. I don't know. I mean, public libraries, yes. but... Well, I'll tell you another thing about it. Um, you know, I, I was going to say, my move to the visual arts is very late in life. It's mm. not true. You know, I've always been interested in the image, mm. particularly interested in photo photography. Yeah. Always been interested in painting. I didn't know very much about it, you know, mm. etc. But uh, then I got involved with Innova and Autograph as the chairs, the two boards, mm. etc. Uh, two things about that. One is that, you know, the artists around them so, are half my age. You know, they really are in their 40s. Lots mm. of them were, you know, active, emerged in the 80s. Mm. So, you know, they're in their, th you know, in their f early 40s now. Mm. So they just kind of rejuvenated me. It was like, a, mm. it was like a dose of monkey gun. <laughs> Come alive again, you know. Yeah. There's lots of people out there who want to talk to you, mm. wh whose work you can help to facilitate, mm. and write a bit in relation to them, as I always do. Mm. I always write a bit in relation to whatever I'm doing, rather than mm. any longer plan, you know, mm. of words. And so that mattered a very great deal. Mm. But the one thing I will say about them is that they're not really very much into books. Mm. You know, they think writing is sort of pa passé. <laughs> Um, they're also not very into, you know, academic writing. Mm. So, you know, this is only mildly, this is only mildly, mm. this is, I mean, it's not true of all of them. Jelaine mm. Tawadros is, you know, mm. very, very in intellectual kind mm. of person. Mark, you know, his heart is elsewhere, mm. um, but he's, you know, he'd recently done an MA and so he's starting to read a lot of the mm. debates that he hadn't read before. Mm. So it's not a hostility, no. but it's just not... Yeah. In, quite in their universe, in the way yeah. in which it is in mine. Yeah? Yes, indeed. So what I'm very glad about is that yeah. there's this subversive thing called an old star library with a lot of books <laughs> 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 sitting there at the heart of this yeah. you know, visual arts building, wonderful building, etc. Quietly throbbing away. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What a fantastic thing. <laughs> well, you know, as well, I mean, and many people have, have, have said this, you know, that your work has been enabling, and you know, we were just talking about it, I certainly feel that very strongly. Um, so, you know, many respects, but I bet a lot of those books that are in that library are people that your work has touched yes, no, indirectly or, or directly. You know. No, that's true, yeah. Oh, yes, it's not sort of, you know, it's not at all surprising or out of order that it should be there. That is, mm. that is quite true. Mm. On the other hand, you know, it represents all those things I don't really know about but would like to know about. Mm. Yeah, I would really like to know more about art and the history of art, and especially the history of modern art. Mm. And modern, you know, I'd like to be able to write with more authority about that mm. than I feel really confident in doing. Though I've written mm. recently, you know, I've written about much more about that than about anything else mm. in the last seven or eight years. Yeah. But it's not an area which I feel is mine in the way in which mm. other areas were. Mm. Um, so it's it's not unrelated to it. And actually, more surprisingly, many people say now, including artists, how formative that work was in some ways for them. Mm. And you know, I don't quite understand it. Mm. Uh, I did an interview with Hans Ulbrich, you know who he is? Mm, yeah, uh, sure. Yes, and he's mm. now at the, at the Serpentine, mm. etc. He thought this interview was, he published it in a book of uh, uh, discussions with artists. He mainly wanted to know who, how many artists were at the Center for Cultural Studies, you know, what were they interested in. Of course, there weren't any. No. Not one. No. You know? There were a few people interested in photography after a while, mm. but it just wasn't like that. So, mm. you know, it's partly because cultural studies has now become a much broader set of influences, and yeah. then visual cultural studies is a mm. kind of 
mm. illegitimate child and mm. that taken it into art history and mm. inflected the field, etc. Mm. So I quite understand why they imagine mm. that this is where culture studies began, although mm. it, it, it wasn't. The mm. same thing used to happen about film. Mm. You know, we were passionately interested in film, and film is for me, in, in some ways, the visual medium that I most respond to, directly respond to, and emotionally yeah. respond to. But we didn't have the money to mm. work on film, yeah. you know, to show film, get extracts, get copies, etc. Mm. You can't work without that, mm. you know, the primary medium to look at all the time. So we sort of decided we couldn't do much research on film, mm. the culture study. Mm. But people imagine that the culture yeah. study was falling down with film. Yeah. <laughs> and the same bit, a bit about visual arts now. But I, sp I suppose one of the things which um, I just preparing for today of things that you've said in the past is how much there was at stake in the artistic work of, of well, a whole range of, of, of artists of, of I guess who were coming of age in the in the eighties. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't surprise me to hear them say also that the the ideas and the things that you opened at that yes. time yes. enabled them to think about what they could do differently. Yes. Yes. Well. I think that is the, I mean, that's the key moment in a sense. And mm. It's a big explosion in the visual arts and photography mm. amongst second, second generation black people. Yeah. Uh, it was born out of British racism and anti racism rather than, you know, the colonial or mm. the slavery or, you know, it's yeah. born out of what, that ex direct experience. Yeah. And by then I was writing about that. Yeah. yeah, you know, quite consistently, and in, 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 in a sense more consistently than ever had before. Yeah. And also, I mean, it's, it's very much a mutual reciprocal influence, you know. Mm -hmm. I could see that they were deeply concerned about identity and their relation to the present and the past, yeah. but that it couldn't be, their relationship could not be described in terms of a return to roots, mm. okay? And so I wrote about that, I wrote about cultural identity in those terms. Mm. Well, they were some of the people I was looking at, mm. so not surprisingly, yeah. they found, you know, the way in which I tried to explore that in some of those essays, mm. sympathetic. Yeah. So it was a double movement, really. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's not the first time that's happened. Mm. The fact is, I don't want to go into this, please. Mm. But, you know, I left the Caribbean in flight from the Caribbean. Yeah. I felt I couldn't be, you know, I couldn't fulfill my potential mm. there, and I couldn't work out my relationship to Jamaican culture. Yeah. I just couldn't, because of my uh, middle class formation, because mm. my parents were not only brown, but thought, you know, yeah. the world had disappeared with the departure of the British. It's sure. the coming departure of the British. Okay, so I was in flight. And then I discovered my subject. Yeah. My subject was coming out of the station at Paddington. You know, it was <laughs> Caribbean's hair. It was the Windrush hair. That has been my subject. So this is what I had to explain when I did the conference. And, you know, are you a Caribbean intellectual? Yes, but it's not the Caribbean you have in mind. I unfortunately mm. have not participated in the building of mm. the nation there. So I'm mm. at a little bit of distance from the national moment which set fire to their imagination in mm. Kingston. Mm. But Caribbean people have been my continuous subject. And lo lots of things that I've written about that don't appear to be about that yeah. are through the prism yes, of trying to work out who they are, who they think they are, where they want to go, where have they come from, what's their relation to the past, what's their memories, etc., mm -hmm. and the, how they express their creativity, you know, how they express where they want to go to next. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, what has been, in a sense, my subject. Yeah. So that is really where cultural studies began. It didn't begin with Raymond Williams. It no. began with my tussle to come to terms with that experience. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, which is when I first discovered I was a black intellectual. Mm -hmm. I never called myself black ever in my life. Nor did most people, many, many people in Jamaica, including lots of people who were black, mm -hmm. did not think of themselves in the way in which people after the late 60s mm -hmm. came to think of themselves as black. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was a discovery for me. It was a discovery of, a rediscovery of the Caribbean in new terms. And 
a rediscovery of my thinking about culture, mm -hmm. and a rediscovery of the black subject. Mm -hmm. So it's not surprising that no. people who are then painting out of yeah. the invisibility, the marginalization of the black body, and of the black subject, and the black experience, mm -hmm. should hear something resonating, of that resonating in my writing. No, absolutely. And it's not just a sort of chosen intellectual project, you know what I mean? Mm. I didn't choose that. I, I had no alternative. <laughs> I mean, I, I, again, that's, I think, one of the things that's so powerful about your work, and I think that's one of the things that I always, you know, is this way in which you're kind of trying to make sense of those private, yeah. so understood, you know, and not understood, uh, you know, both stra estranged and knowing um, close-up experiences and the wider social, yeah. cultural, political forces. Yeah. Um, well, the, the, uh, I know what you're saying, and uh, uh, I, I don't, it's, not, it's again, not something I try to do, but it's no. just how I write or how yeah, I yeah. think, etc. But I sort of know what that comes out of. Um, you know, it comes out of this horrendous family experience that I had, mm. you know, in which I came to understand that my family were living out in the interstices of the family, the most private domestic space, mm -hmm. this huge colonial drama. I mean, that is what it was about, you know. So it was internalized into the intimate and emotionally charged mm -hmm. sphere, theater of the family. Mm -hmm. But it had no, you know, it wasn't that it was something else. It was the same thing yeah. on another terrain. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, I've really not been good at thinking about the distinction between, you know, private and public, the inside and the outside, mm. subjective interior and objective social. I don't quite sort of buy how that is usually mm. written about or thought about. Mm -hmm. No, no, absolutely not. I mean, um, I was going to ask, ask you about this later, but he, you talk about, um, you've mentioned in passing the idea of an intellectual vocation. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to ask you a little bit about how how you do the, pra the practice of thinking and, and criticism and writing, or is it something that's so habitual to you now that you, you, it's hard to think about? How, how do I do this? How do, do how do I do my the craft of, of, of an intellectual vocation? I'm going to show you the uh, the Caribbean book because I do I do say it, I do respond to the conference. Yeah. by saying, what is this strange object called the thought of Stuart Hall, which is an you know, <laughs> unbelievable title that I gave this conference. Oh, is that what the I book said, is? who is this person that I, you know, we've been discussing for two days. Mm. I sort of see him every now and again. I sort of recognize some people. I recognize the quote, but I don't recognize them all, and I hope people will give me the references. You know, so, uh, I, and I was, when we had the launch, I went back to that. Mm. Um, because it's not something planned, it's mm. not something conscious, um, and perhaps I should say, you know, that it's very limited. You know, mm. there is lots of things it can't do. Mm. You know, I'm very admiring of all sorts of people that do things. Mm. You know, I think much richer and much more important than I do it. Uh, mm. What I came at a certain point, uh, round about the point where the cultural terrain went into high theory. Yeah. yeah? I was nearly lost in a species of ventriloquism. And I suddenly saw through this at the point where people kept making French puns in English. Mm. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't work in English. <laughs> they only worked in French. Mm. You know, and I thought, this is a crazy mm. way to do it. So it's mm. not that one rejected that. but mm. you know, uh, uh, And after that, I just sort of had to think, However you think is how you're going to think, so you better be satisfied with it. Mm. And that's how you write, so write like that, because mm. you know, don't hanker after mm. writing like Foucault. You can't write like Foucault, you know. No, no. I don't have the philosophical training, the, you know, I just, I couldn't do it, I'm not that sort of person. Yeah. So write like you write, accept your own voice. So, having done that, I'm not very good at talking about what that is. Mm. No, I'm not yeah. sure any of us are. Uh, I don't. Um, I think about it, and I have some thoughts now mm. <laughs> about it. Um, and there are things which other people have said. In that book, David Scott says he doesn't read me because of cultural theory. He reads me because of my 
political interventions. Mm. And I realize that almost everything I write is a kind of political intervention. Yeah, it may not be about politics explicitly, mm. but it is trying to shift the terms of the debate, intervene on one side or another, uh, you know, clarify something, uh, wipe some other dis distorting <laughs> views mm. out of place, mm. so that you, you know, something else can come through. Mm. I suppose that's critique or criticism or whatever it is, but I'm aware that th it is a kind of political intervention. I think that accounts for why, A, I've never written a big book, except for Policing the Crisis, which is not really all mine by any means. And secondly, while I write about so many different things, mm. okay, I write mainly because people ask me to. You know, will you write a piece about this? Will you come to the conference and write it up after? Mm, mm. I don't sit in my study and think, mm. I ought to write a piece now about this. Mm. You know, if you look at the stuff I've written on identity, mm. you know, the first piece was given at the film, the first film conference in the Caribbean, you know, they're all occasional pieces. That's why they're not in serious sociological journals. Mm. You know, one of the big pieces on identity and diaspora is in this little collection that Jonathan Rutherford called Identity, you know. Do you, do you understand what I mean? I so do, there yeah. are interventions in a field rather mm. than um, autonomous scholarly, mm. you know, works. Yeah. I mean, Another thing I know about is that I am interested in the conjunction. Yes. I, I am a sort of writer about the present. Yeah. Yes. About, uh, but also I think the past is understood in that way too. Now, you know, people say, what is that? Um, I used to pass it off and say it's what Gramsci's interested in, because Gramsci does write about the difference, yeah, about the conjunctural and the, and the long term, etc. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, people have pointed out to me that Gramsci thought the conjunctural was more superficial. Mm. Okay? And I don't think that mm. so, quite. Mm. Yeah? I don't deny that they're longer term deeper movements mm -hmm. of society and mm -hmm. economy, you mm -hmm. know, which sort of mark out different phases, for instance, in capitalism. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. But I think a conjunctural understanding of the, what is specific about each of those phases, you know, what is specific about merchant capital that is not specific about, you know, mm -hmm. not the same as industrial capital. Mm -hmm. What's interested about Fordist capital that is not the same as global capital. You know, so it's just on the line of capital. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I refer to capital is because this is something that I learned from Marx. Mm -hmm. And f surprisingly, not the Marx most people think about, mm -hmm. okay, because they think Marx unfolded the laws of movement mm -hmm. of capitalism, mm -hmm. okay, which are going to be always the same. Mm -hmm. well, in some ways, yes, and in some ways, no. You know, because of that level of generality, you know, capitalism in the 15th century, <laughs> merchant capital, was the same as global. You know, it's not. Mm. It's not. Of course. So you have to want, uh, and it's partly what I've written about. Anyone whether you ever seen this, I think. About the, um, the uh, Marx's introduction, in 1870 introduction. No, I haven't seen that. In which Marx says, um, First of all, you can't just reflect the empirical in order to analyze it, okay? Because mm. if you look at society, it's full of people, so you'd say you begin with population. Mm. But the people are divided into capital, labor, slave and mm. <laughs> slaveholder, mm. and that division, that difference, is more important mm. than just the fact that they're people. Mm. He calls the fact that, beginning with population, mm. a chaotic abstraction. And the abstractions that arise from the differences mm -hmm. is more worked through. Mm -hmm. That accounts for why he says you need theory, not mm -hmm. to produce more theory, excuse mm -hmm. me, mm -hmm. <laughs> but because you can't do without it. You have to yeah. break into yeah. the confusing you know, um, fabric that mm -hmm. the real apparently gives you mm -hmm. and find a way in. He says, mm -hmm. like a microscope. Mm -hmm. And until you put a bit on the microscope, do you see the hidden relations? Yeah. Okay? And he describes this process as adding different, more levels of determination. Mm. Okay? So you have to add more. Uh, to the basic laws may be the same, 
But you had to add more levels of determination before you, and this is another phrase of his, produce the concrete in thought. Yeah. Yeah. And so my notion of the conjunctural is more like that than mm. it's like Gramsci. Mm. I, I really believe that the work is done by historical specificity, right. by understanding what is specific about certain moments yeah. and how those moments come together, form a kind of configuration, yeah. never, you know, one that's going to last forever, yeah. again, and it never does, you know, it always has unruly elements and it's always yeah. struggling to master a terrain, etc. Yeah, yeah. And those forces are going to produce another conjunction, a shift to another conjunction. Mm. In Britain, the late 70s is a conjuncture of the conjunctural shift of that kind. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. What we now, what I thought of Thatcherism mm. was really the end of something and the beginning of something else. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we're not going to go back to what was before it, so that's mm. why I'm interested in thinking you know, the values that we hold in terms of the present. Yeah. But my sense of that break mm. People do ask me, how do you know of that? <laughs> mm. I can't tell them that. No. It's not a methodology, you know, mm. it's not uh, something which I apply outside to it. Mm. I have to feel the kind of accumulation of things going on, yeah. you know, and think this is a different rhythm. This is, yeah. a, you know, we've lived with one configuration and this is another one. Yeah, yeah. Now, let us try to say what that transition means, what this new one is, what the forces in it are, yeah. what the contradictory things, etc. So, I think conjuncturally. Yeah. Yes, I am what Larry Gosberg calls a radical conjuncturalist. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Could I just, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about books, and I want to mainly speak about the conjuncture of yes. now, as, as yes. you see it, rather than asking you to go back over things that you've probably spoken about many yes. times before. Yes. But I, I, this is a selfish question. Um, I, I remember hearing you on the radio uh, doing your Desert Island Discs, partly yes. where I got the tip about Miles Davis. But yes. um, also, you chose a Henry James' portrait of a lady yes. to take with you. Yes. And I know that, did, 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 you, did you begin to, to write about... I did my PhD on James, yes. so I didn't finish it. Oh, okay. And I just wanted to ask you about that book and others that you would may you may choose. If I could give you, first, say, five, would there be other books that you'd be immediately be able to? What is what is it about Henry James? First of all, well, that's a different question. Yeah. I mean, that's a question in its own right. Yeah. What is it about James? Well, you know, you have to remember that I went my undergraduate training is in literature. Yeah. Yeah. I've never had a training in anything else. To be <laughs> absolutely honest. Uh, so when the vice chancellor of the Open University said, but uh, are you, um, you've been in literature, you've been in cultural studies, are you willing to profess sociology? <laughs> I said, I'm willing to profess anything. <laughs> 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 Only give me a job. <laughs> so, you know, my training is in literature, okay? Mm. Uh, when it came to, I was disappointed with the Oxford course because it's, so lodged in the past. Yeah. I had to do so much Anglo-Saxon. You know, I was never very good at languages. I mm. hated it. Mm. I was interested in medieval literature, but I was interested in a critical way, not in a scholarly mm. way. You know, so on. So I pushed towards the modern. So when I thought of staying on to do my PhD, I thought, what would you like to write about? Mm. Well, what I wanted to write about was the sort of social realist literature, American literature of the 30s. Mm. And they said, well, you can't do that because most of these people are still living. <laughs> Even <laughs> Dos Passos is still alive. <laughs> well, you know, so in any case, I'd been reading a lot of American literature. American literature was for me a kind of escape mm. from the constraints of Oxford English in those days. Mm. Um, and so I began to read Hawthorne, and Hawthorne led me back to James, and so on. Okay, so I got interested in Jane. And I was aware of the fact that this was a pretty bizarre encounter. You know, this black boy mm. <laughs> from Kingston mm. and this highly refined, sophisticated mind, you know. Mm. So I never confused myself with Henry James. Mm. But two things interested me about him. One was the international theme. Yeah? Mm. The fact that the novels are all often, some are not, the few are not, but mm. many of his work, early and late, mm. 
is around this contrast between Europe and America, or yeah. contrast between one place and another, yeah. Europe and somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. And although the other place is not at all the same as my own, mm -hmm. I'm aware of the fact that you know, that is a kind of diasporic imagination. Mm -hmm. Genesis is a kind of diasporic imagination. Mm -hmm. But you wouldn't dream of using that about mm -hmm. his work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I wanted to write about the international theme. Mm -hmm. okay. And he goes over it three times, once in the very early novels, Daisy Miller, Bostonians, Europeans, etc. Then again in the big novels, The Ambassador of the Golden Bowl. Mm -hmm. And then wonderful, unfinished work at the end, one in particular where he goes back to America and encounters the self that he would have been, a businessman, that yeah. he would have been if he yeah. stayed. Yeah. Okay? And it's the source of T. S. Eliot's thing about on the winding stair. Yeah. On the first turn of the winding stair yes. because there's uh, and there's an ivory tower in yeah. which he encounters this other self. Yeah. He sees the other self across the yeah, you know, yeah. across the space. Yeah. You know, I just thought this is incredible stuff. And a, a, a way of thinking about James that I hadn't seen before. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I want to write about. Mm. And then uh, I wanted, I was of course interested, if you're interested in James, you're interested in the statement that he made, I want to be someone on whom nothing is lost. You know, I want to be a, a consciousness that could respond to everything in the world. You know? But not universal, you know, mm. what James said. You can tell that from five minutes of somebody's story at dinner mm. is the source of our next novel. I don't want to hear any more. Mm. I don't want the, the literal detail. Yeah. I want to explore the consciousness and the lives that come out of that. Yeah. You know? But it, it must be to the full extent of my consciousness. Mm. Now, I mean, the funny thing about that is that there is no full extent of one's consciousness because there's always the unconscious that one can't think about. Mm. And there was in James, too, very profoundly, wonderful things that uh, uh, um, Colm Tobin has written in The Master. I think it's a fantastic novel. Mm. Yeah, lots of unconsciousness in James. But he wanted to take the conscious as far as he could, mm. you know, in each situation. Well, I just found, you know, I didn't care about the fact that he mainly wrote about rich people. Yes. You know, Shakespeare mainly wrote about kings and queens, so yes. what? Yes. You know? This usually doesn't work at that literal level. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't find out what kings and queens, you go and read you some history, mm -hmm. you know? You read King Lear for something else, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, in the same way I feel about James. Yes, mm -hmm. I didn't mind about the fact that lots of the content of his material was uh, alien to me. Mm. I say one more thing which has just occurred to me, which is, of course, I say his other was different from mine. Mm. But his other was America. Mm. And America has played a very important role in my thinking. Yes. You know, I mean, because America was, it's funny, America was the site of escape for me when I was in Kingston, although I didn't go there. Mm. You know, I came to England because the lines of connection were still to the mother country. Now, all the intellectuals go and are teaching and writing in the U.S., yes, yes, or the Caribbean. Yeah. But although my connection was there, you know, my imaginative escape was cinema, mm -hmm. I went to film every Monday mm -hmm. or every Saturday, mm -hmm. you know, throughout my teenage life, and a very rich period it was. Mm -hmm. Bogart, you know, uh, um, Bette Davis, you know, uh, uh, Incredible cinema, mm -hmm. American cinema, and American music, mm -hmm. and jazz. So, you know, and then once, once one comes to England, America stands as, you know, that which is modern, which is not, you know, borne down by the social class system, mm -hmm. which is, you know, etc. It's a source of, you know that ambivalence, the ambivalence one feels about America. Mm -hmm. And I can't stand it at the moment. You know, I wouldn't mm -hmm. go there. I don't go there. I'm mean, sure they wouldn't let me in, but you know, I really don't go. I don't want to go there. Mm -hmm. And it's not just because of Bush. People say Bush, but it's not that. It's about the culture in a much wider sense. Yes. But at one point, America was a source of liberation for yes. us all. Uh, and the coming of rock and roll, you mm -hmm. know, transformed English popular culture. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it wasn't that James is other. Of course, mm. he wasn't writing about that bit either. Mm. Uh, he wasn't writing about you know, the black experience. He wanted to go to Ralph Ellison mm. and to um, 
Baldwin and so mm. on for that. But still, America was not as foreign as it might have sound. I mean, sitting in Oxford, reading about James, writing about New England, yeah. was not quite as absurd as it has seemed to many people since. Yeah. No, no, it's not absurd. And I didn't. That, that, I'm glad I asked that. I'm glad I asked you that. I'm so selfish. But the idea of the of the life that you know, counting the life that you may have had, yeah. as you said, that made me uh, rem- reminded me of of a, a few comments you made about sometimes you think about the life you would have had yes, had you stayed in in Germany. I do. I think about that very much because you know my school generation were in the thick of independence. Mm. You know? I left. You know, people don't remember. I left. I came into England in 1951. Mm. Jamaica wasn't independent until 1962. Cool. So, you know, the people who grew up as the lead, political leaders, the political class, mm. defining the nation after decolonization, mm. were all the people I knew, mm. and yet I wasn't there. Mm. You know, I followed it. Uh, my, uh, hopes and fears mm. were lodged mm. in it. Mm. I often went back. I sort of debated with them. You know, I tried at one one point to bring a sort of reconciliation between the black power people and the Marxists. You know, mm. which, uh, so I f- I wanted to be part of it. But I have always the sense that that could have been me. Mm. I know many people who are, who could be like me. They went to the big secondary schools like me. They mm. were you know in my class at Jamaica College. Mm. You know, they're judges and political leaders mm. and senior civil servants and so mm. on. Many of them retiring now mm. or retired. Uh, so there always was another life. Mm. And, uh, you know, there's also the long period in which I wasn't sure whether I was going home or not. Yeah. You know, after I uh, gave up my thesis and moved to London. I was sort of going home any time now. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Perhaps I'm still going home any time now. You know, it wasn't true. I wasn't going back. I mm. knew to go back at that point for me was psychic death. It was death. It would have yeah. enclosed itself around me. I could feel the waiting of me. Yeah, so yeah. I was right not to go back. But it is a loss. You know, one, one has to say that. Mm-hmm. Diaspora is a loss, you know, it's not, you know, it's not forever, mm-hmm. it doesn't mean that you can't do something about it or that yeah. other places can't fill the gap, the void, yeah. but the void is always the regret for a moment that wasn't, you know, that yeah. wasn't realized. History is full of what is not realized, of course. and I feel that about it. Whenever I go back, I think, I'm at home, but I'm not at home. Mm. It, it, it reminded me of, uh, as you were talking, a uh, uh, beautiful George Lambing book, The Pleasures of Exile. Mm. On the one hand, the pleasure, the freedom of, of exile, at the same time, the loss yeah. which you're describing. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful book. Uh, uh, it's a very, very important book for me. It has been a very important book. Yeah. That is, I, of course, I knew George in London. Mm. Um, I used to work for the Caribbean World Service, which you know, a lot of writers did. Mm. But the Caribbean novel was written in London. Yeah. And what's more, uh, we became consciously West India in London. I came as a Jamaican. I'd never been to anywhere else in the Caribbean. Mm-hmm. I remember one at one point in, my, in the sixth form, mm-hmm. a Latin master came from Barbados <laughs> to teach us. Well, I'd been taught by the Scots, by the British, by the Irish, but I'd never been taught by a Caribbean. Mm. And I thought his accent was the funniest thing I ever heard. <laughs> you know, I thought he was from outer space. <laughs> we used to have this joke with him, you know. Barbados is, of course, they produce good cricketers because it's so small, the whole island is the field. <laughs> and they just hit the ball into, into the, the sea, sea to get us, there, you know. <laughs> so, very strange. Suddenly, we discovered what was common, in spite of what is, you know, of course, the islands are all different, mm. but nevertheless, there's a kind of core commonness. Mm. So I discovered myself as a West Indian at that point. Mm. So this is a very liberating moment for me. Mm. There, there's a, uh, I mean, there's a, a, a dark moment in that because what that meant was that politically the idea of a West Indian Federation became all of our hopes. Yeah. Yeah. We thought we can't do this without each other. <laughs> it works yeah. in London. It produces wonderful literature. Yeah. You know, each place is too small to sustain. Mm. And I suppose if eventually 
the Federation had come off, I might well have gone home. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but it didn't. Mm -hmm. And by then I sort of, yeah, I don't know when I took the decision not to go. Mm -hmm. By then it was sort of made, really. Mm -hmm. So uh, the pleasures of exile, you know, I feel, I feel, my, I feel my experience to be close to two books. Mm -hmm. One is Larry's The Pleasure of Exile. The other is Edward Said's Out of Place. Yes. Yeah? I, though on the other side of the world, yeah. in relation to a different, you know, set of cultures, etc., uh, I just find myself r read into yeah. the center of Edward's book. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Could you say a little bit more about that, and uh, in what in in what ways? I mean, are, are they're obvious in a way, but I just wanted to know. Well, it's a, it's a, you know it's in the title. It's the mm. notion of out of place. Yeah. Yeah. I felt out of place in Jamaica, mm -hmm. and when I came to England, I felt out of place in Merton College, Oxford, yeah. and I felt out of place, in, you know, I feel out of place in relation to the British, which might sound a very strange thing, because mm -hmm. I've lived here for 50 years, 50-something years. Yeah, I know the different kinds of English, British yeah. people, you know, I know how the society works from the inside, mm -hmm. I love parts of the landscape, you know. I feel at one with it. It is my home in a certain kind of way. But I will never be English. Mm -hmm. Never. I can't be. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, traces in my life and the traces in my memory and mm -hmm. the traces in my history of another place mm -hmm. are just ineradicable. Mm -hmm. I can't get them out of my head. Mm -hmm. So, but I don't want to have a fight about it, <laughs> no. but that's just how one is. So, mm -hmm. being displaced or out of place mm. is a characteristic experience of mine. It's mm. mm. been all through my, throughout my life. Mm. I felt displaced in relation to black culture in Jamaica. You know, I was at one, I was a kind of nationalist from the very beginning. Lots of my friends were, we wanted, you know, we were anti-imperialist, we wanted Jamaica to be free, etc. Mm. But in relation to black culture and the life of ordinary people, I really didn't know what it was about mm. in any depth. Mm. And I couldn't get to it. You know. mm. As a middle class brown schoolboy or mm. middle class parent, I couldn't get to it. Mm. I could sort of imagine it and relate to it uh, uh, by empathy. Mm. But I couldn't be of it. You know. I was never a street boy. I can't pretend to have been it because mm. I wasn't. You know. So. Do you know what I mean? I do. Uh, I and so, do, yeah. even out of place in relation then to what became black in England, yeah. you know, because the image of that is, you know, black people sometimes say, I'm going to say this in a, um, speaking into something about the anniversary of the end of slavery. Mm -hmm. Black people sort of talk about things like slavery as if they know it in their genes. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't need to find out about it because if you're black, you know it. Well, you know, first of all, I don't believe that. You know, I think, unfortunately, a lot of black people don't know enough about their own history yes, to begin with, and aren't passing it on to their kids and so on. That, that's a separate question, but that, that is what I feel. Yes. But, you know, I, I've always felt that uh, um, there's no kind of automatic, you know, relationship. It's mm. forged. Mm. Jamaica became consciously black in the 60s mm. and early 70s. It wasn't. I didn't care what people looked like. Mm. And, you know, remember that people don't always look like people here imagine them to do. Indeed. Most people who go to the Caribbean are surprised yeah. at the range of colors that people are. Yeah. You know? And the more we know about it, the more we know a lot of people who look black are not in any sense genetically African. Mm. Mm. Okay? Mm. It's a very mixed, very hybrid society. Yeah. Black is important because it's the bit that is never named, mm. never spoke. Mm. Yes, couldn't speak its history until it was released. Yes. That wasn't until after independence. So, mm. you know, all of us in different ways learn to be black. Oh, all of us are out of place in relation to slavery. How can we think about slavery? You know, how can we think about ancestors of mine being, mm. you know, enslaved in chains to mm. somebody else, particularly to the English and the Scots? Mm. <laughs> It's it's kind of one thing. So I think I think out of placeness yeah. is inevitably a condition of the diaspora. Yeah. But it's strangely enough a condition of the Caribbean too. 
Mm. She's, of course, a diaspora. Yes, of course. Because everybody who is there came from somewhere else. People who belong there were wiped out in a hundred years. Yes. And everybody comes from somewhere else. The Spanish, the Dutch, the French, the British, yeah. the Africans, the Indians, the Chinese, the Portuguese. Yeah. They're all from somewhere else. Yeah. We are the, you know, one of the first diaspora societies. Yeah. So, uh, I don't think it's just, you know, because of my peculiar no. biographical history. Why I feel... Yeah. I mean, I wonder whether it's, it's, it's part of that sense of dislocation or out-of-placeness also you might... Uh, this sounds going to sound crass, but I don't mean it to no. be. But there, there's an, that sense of not being quite kind of... Um, one with. Yeah, one with. Yeah. And so it's sort of completely um, blind to yeah. what one is one with. Yes. Or deaf yes. to. Um, whether it produces kind of insight yeah. too as well. Well, as I suppose it does. Um, I, I used to comfort myself, I think, yeah. that, you know, Zimmel said, you know, the stranger has insights into, yeah. into where he or she is, yeah. which the people who live it instinctively, live their culture instinctively, can't possibly have, yeah. need the shock of transition, and mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I, I think that may be, may be true. Mm -hmm. I thought you were going to say something else, which mm -hmm. is that, well, really, a lot of people who aren't diasporic also have that. No, that's true. I mean, I think that's true of, any, of all kinds. I think that, I mean, but you see, I think one of the things as well, the lessons that, which was a revelation, I think, for many of us, was that, you know, the idea that there is no uh, us without uh, another. Yeah. Or that the implication, the mutual implications of all these stories yeah. of being out of place are, yeah. are about, you know, it, it, using it to decide words, overlapping histories. Yes, yes. Um, um, but uh, no, I, I think that is true. Well, you know, there's a little piece of mine called Minimal Cells. At the yes, Radio. of course. <laughs> yeah. And this was, you know, at a conference of the ICA, mm. yeah, which myself, Homi Baba, I don't remember who else spoke, mm. okay, it was about sort of identity. Mm. And I looked out into the hall, you know, and I saw, you know, a lot of white faces, some. Mm. Facing, etc. And one after another, everybody stood up and said, "Well, actually, I'm not really English because my parents come from Australia, <laughs> yeah, or yeah. from the north, or yeah. from Scotland, <laughs> or from Wales." You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I suddenly got this feeling that everybody was diaspora. <laughs> you know, there wasn't an English person in the, in the yeah. room. And my friend Peter Wallen, I met him in the loo. And I said, Peter, speak up for England. That's the right English person. <laughs> speak up for England. I always thought of him as a kind of quintessentialist English person. Yeah. He's not at all. His mother was yeah. French. You know, he lived a lot of long time in France. Yeah. So I, I went back into the room and I said, Welcome to the diaspora. Mm. You know, welcome to being diasporic. Mm. Something about modern experience mm. is the experience of that dislocation, which yes. I associated very much with my own experience and with yeah. uh, living in the diaspora. Could I, could I ask you a little bit about, I mean, there's another little, this is a selfish byline, but I, I read that you had taught for a while as well during those years in, in London, and you taught in South London too. Yeah, that, right? yes, when um, I left university, I, yeah. I left university, came to London, I was editing Universities and Left Review, mm. which had an office in Soho. Mm. I lived in South London, yeah. in Clapham, oh, really? in the house of a wonderful old Trotskyist called Jock Haston. Yeah. Okay? Uh, and I wanted to stay in London mm. uh, until I went home. I was still not quite deciding when I'm going. Mm. Okay? Um, so I thought, well, what can you do? Practically nothing. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't then drive, so I couldn't drive a milk float. Mm. You know, you can teach. So I got a job as a, as in the secondary school, mm. as a supply teacher. Yeah. So I, you know, you're sent around to different schools, mm. but this school um, was unable to retain any of its supply teachers, or indeed its teachers. Mm. So once I got in there, they uh, they never let me go. So mm. I was supply teacher in. A Kennington school, mm. Kennington Oval. Really? Yes, for quite a, quite a while, about three or four years. And I used to leave 
there, get on the train, go to Soho and edit the journal, mm -hmm. and go back on the night bus, mm -hmm. <laughs> try to wake up in time to get to <laughs> the oval <laughs> for, yeah. for uh, the opening of class. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I've written a bit about that. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an essay which has never been republished in University Left Review called Absolute Beginners. Oh, I don't think I've seen that one. Which is sort of a nod to an old friend yeah, because I've got to know um, Colin McInnes well. Yeah. But it's about my experience in secondary school. Yeah. I love those books as well. They're ones that are very important to me. Yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> yeah. But was that experience too... I, I, I'm not trying to lead you to this, but to say this, but I wondered... Uh, I, one of the things I read was that, you know, some of the kids you took home afterwards because of the kind of intensity of street racism... Oh, no. Home, no, no like? I followed them. Mm. I was going to edit the journal. Oh, I see. And all of a sudden, these kids, yeah. who were bedded down in South London, and yeah. I wasn't sure they'd ever even been to Piccadilly Circus, yeah. were actually on the train. Yeah. And I said... Where are you going? Yeah. <laughs> oh, sir, we're going across town. <laughs> no, across town. <laughs> we're going to Notting Hill, mm. Shepherd's Bush. I said, what's going on there? Bit of argy bargy, mm. they said. And so, you know, then I began to get interested in all sorts of other things. And a lot of people then working in Notting Hill mm. came to New Left Review mm. and came to the club. Mm. And people got involved in in in, in the Notting Hill riots and mm. their aftermath, etc. Mm -hmm. But I I used to go down there and to see where on earth these kids were. Yeah. And they were on the street corners and the adults were in the bars, shouting through the doors, and they were harassing women who were walking home from work. Really? Yeah, black women who were walking home from work, really? going into the you know Powys Terrace and. The terrace is behind, but coming out of yeah. of Notting Hill or Queens, wow. Queens Park, etc. So then I got involved through the club. Do you know Michael De Freitas? You know Michael. Yes, yes of course I do. Yeah. Michael came to the to the New Left Club. Really? Yeah. And you know, I got to know him. First of all, we talked about jazz because Michael was passionate about jazz. Yeah. And he used to go to Stockholm, you know, <laughs> at the weekends. Yeah. To hear jazz bands, American jazz bands. Wow. But after a bit, he said, "Well, you know, a lot of going on around my place." Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, Michael was a throw of black families out of their homes mm. for what's the name of the guy? Ra Rackman. Rackman, of course, yeah, the yeah. notorious Rackman. Yeah. yeah, he was a sort of strong arm man. Yeah, yeah. On the other hand, you know, he had all these local connections. He didn't like what was going on. He said, we must do something about this. Yeah. But this is why I think, you know, Michael X is, Michael X is a tragedy, because he had exactly the same formation as Malcolm X, mm. you know, who was a, you know, exactly the same hustling background. Mm. And Malcolm became something in Michael's way. Mm. Anyhow, all that I meant about this is you know, irrelevant. It's just that we got involved in Notting Hill. And I, but my first... Yeah. awareness that something was happening in Notting Hill before the riot yeah. by kids in my school. Wow. So when we got back to school, I said, what are you doing up there? You know, <laughs> oh, you know, I said, why are you shouting at them? Said, well, they're taking our girl, our women. I said, what are you? <laughs> you know, if only you had any women. <laughs> 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 and, uh, you know, they're, 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 um, they're taking our things. So I said, do you mean these? And I pointed to several black kids in the class. Yeah. And they looked at them as if they'd never seen them. No, yeah. sir. You man. know, they're one of us. So I said, what about me? No, sir, not you, them. Mm. <laughs> but it was a very important experience for me. Incredible. I mean, what an incredible scene, actually. And also, I guess, in that one moment, a whole... Conjuncture, really, about that is the, a a, of, of popular race that to, is a and formation. That's, yeah. That's when a great deal of racism has been simmering underneath, yeah. you know, finally gets spoken, yeah. finally erupts in a kind of straightforward, open aggression and violence. Yeah. It's a moment like powerlessness in 68, Indeed. Yeah? when people can say and do on the street. Yeah. what they've been careful not to say and do Indeed. until that moment. But you know, the, how you know, sort of profound in the sense that you're they're being taught by Stuart Hall. 
who they don't count as being in the, the them. Yes. And their black friends who are there walking home from school with maybe not, but or, but it's certainly yes. being played, but they don't count as being them either. Yes, yeah. Sure. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Funny. Complicated. I became aware of how complicated, you know, local allegiances and, you know, images of the people outside. I think you've written about yourself. I love teaching. That was completely harrowing for me. <laughs> you know, first of all, I couldn't keep discipline. <laughs> because, you know, I was very young still, and I know it, had no experience of teaching. I'd never been taught to teach. Uh, I was given a class which was 4FX. This is the secondary modern school. Yeah. So everybody in it has failed their 11 plus. Okay? They started A, 1A, 1B, 1C, and at about 1E, they fade into 1FX. Yeah? Yeah. So this is right at the bottom. Yeah. You know? What does that have to do with them? So I said, what are you going to do when you, you, know, when you leave school? Oh, so we're going into the print. Mm -hmm. Okay, their oh, fathers all worked then in the print. Mm -hmm. they, that was the only route into the print. You couldn't get into the print yeah. industry by yeah. knocking on the door and filling out a form. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, they, they didn't see any reason why they should ever do study mm -hmm. anything again. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd take them, I'd teach them. I tried to teach them English grammar. Can you imagine? <laughs> Gerunds. <laughs> <laughs> Commas and semicolons. Yeah. Uh, I had to teach them <laughs> geography, you know. And one day the geography master came in and said, this is interesting, you're teaching them about the trade wind, except that you've got the southeast and the northwest. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong way around. <laughs> and I was so naive, I'd left it on the board for all to see, you know. I, you know, I tried to read, I tried to get them to do um, uh, to act Romeo and Juliet, mm -hmm. you know, craziness, mm -hmm. uh, just complete crazy. and made up, you know, out of my head, mm -hmm. really. But I also had to take them swimming mm -hmm. and do life-saving. Mm -hmm. I'd never life-saved in anything in my life, so I was so terrified. <laughs> I, I said, before we go to the pool, mm -hmm. we're going to practice mm -hmm. life-saving in the hall upstairs. Mm -hmm. I had to, this kid, all lying on the hall, you know, saving one another. So <laughs> well, I read the book. Eventually, of course, I had to take them to the pool. Yeah. I, I was sure one of them was going to drown. Right, I was yeah. absolutely certain. But they didn't. My only problem was when coming back from school on a Friday afternoon from the pool, I was supposed to bring them back to school mm. to, or to be dismissed. Mm. Okay? Well, they were passing their homes. Yeah. You know, it was complete ridiculous nonsense. They were not mm. going back to school for anything, mm. bring them to school and dismiss them. Mm. So, of course, they used to peel off, you know, they just disappear. So I'd start out with 30, yeah. and by the end, yeah. I had about 15, 15 stragglers, yeah. etc. Yeah. So, no. it's a very rich experience. Wonderful not for experience. Very long. Yeah, no, incredible. I, I wanted to, um, I, I could, we could talk for days, I'm sure, but... Um, uh, I wanted, I, I wanted just to share this experience with you because uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the way in which we, we were talking before we started with the tape recorder about the understanding of what was possible in that sort of in those early years, I guess. Of yes. the, you know, um, but I, remember I taught, I often teach the culture's ordinary uh, essay from Owen Williams. Yes. Um, well, every time I teach a first year undergraduate class I start off and start with that and there's something about what you were saying about being out of place the library figuring in within that essay too yes. and the tea shop and all that stuff yes. anyway. but um, I did my spiel on this particular year on, on, on Williams and said about him and I showed some images of him showed the you know the the signal box and all those images yeah. so, and then there's this uh, black student at the, at the at the back of the class puts his hand up and says um, Les but you know I read this essay and I really loved it, but I felt sure that Williams was black. <laughs> and he just assumed, because yeah. what he was describing was that sense yeah. of out of placeness, I suppose, yes. or that. Yes. Um, yes, of course. And uh, and I know that some people, are, uh, um, um, sloppy thinking people, have written about you know that you, in your writing you, you appear to have come to some of these issues yes. late in yes. your writing, yes. which uh, you know, given all that you've said already. Yeah. Uh, you know. But I wanted to ask, uh, to, to ask you a little bit about what was possible in terms of talking, making the connection between that 
you know, that Kennington School and the drama, the theatre of race and racism that's unfolding there. And then the, uh, the kind of intellectual political circles. Um, that well, you know, I was, uh, you know, I also became a socialist mm. and part of the left in mm. Oxford. Yeah. University and Left Review mm. started in Oxford mm. um, in response to 56 and all mm. that. Mm. So, if you're out of place, the left becomes a kind of home, mm. you know? And so for a time, I was, uh, you know, lots of people like Raphael Samuel and Peter Cedric and, you know, Chuck Taylor and all of those mm. people were my interlocutors. Yes. Um, and in that period, I read, I'd read a bit of Marx before, but I read Marx for the first time. Mm. And I used to go to, I was one of the few people my, with myself and a Scot called Alan Hall, who were permitted to go to Communist Party meetings and not be communists. <laughs> Because they thought we'll get them soon. Mm. Yeah? I had no intention of becoming a communist. But I used to go. Mm. Okay? So you know, and I would argue with them and argue with with Raphael about class and you know. So of course I was involved in those debates mm. and in that politics. Mm. Okay. Now um, the politics, the politics about class. Okay. Mm. And I suspect that the inability to understand some of those things is because of the diminution of the politics of class. Yeah. Yeah? So before the critique of the exclusiveness of the politics of class mm. arises, and it doesn't arrive on, you know, until the social movements of the 70s, really, yeah. uh, until that moment, you know, everything was organized through the perspective of class and its politics. Yeah. The black people in Britain who came in the early 50s, were they members of the working class? Yeah, lots of them were. Mm. Did they have the same kind of class consciousness? Clearly not. If mm. you're a conjuncturist like me, mm. the difference between Raymond Williams' class consciousness in you know in mm. the in the railways in South mm. in South Wales, and if you come from the back streets of Kingston, is very evident. Mm. Race is bl the black cause. The politics that arises from race mm. is not an autonomous arena to which you could relate until, mm. I would say, the early 70s. Yeah. Yeah? It doesn't surface in that way, early 70s. Mid-60s. Mm. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Mid-60s. Um, so, it's not that one didn't think about that. Let me put it personally. It's not that I didn't think about that. Mm. But I thought partly one is a subordinate element of the other. Yeah. Yeah. Really, this is a question about capitalism and imperialism, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. and the poverty of Jamaica, mm -hmm. the, um, uh, the, the situation in which black men and women find themselves in urban deprivation, mm -hmm. and class politics is really slightly differentiated part of one whole thing. Mm -hmm. I'm not defending this, you know. I'm no, 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 telling you, no, no. This, is the, this is the consciousness you're inside, mm -hmm. okay? It's not a moment of autonomous black politics, and that mm. debate doesn't happen until later. Mm. And it happens in relation to the arrival on the scene of a black presence. Mm. You know? And mm. that happens kind of in relation, in, in response to racism, yes. which is very, as we said, in the Notting Hill period, you know, it's just coming to the surface as a mm. conscious political movement and issue. Mm. Okay? The response to that in terms of anti-racism doesn't come on till a bit later than that. Mm. So there isn't, there wasn't really that politics. You, know, you couldn't get writing about black politics in the way in which you could in the US. Because mm. black presence you know, has been there for yeah. forever. It's, it's written into part of what America is, of what a, to be American is. Mm. It wasn't written into part of what to be British was. Of course, imperialism was, but it all happened so far away. Yeah. You know, to try to indigenize that in mm. relation to Britain and find a way mm. of saying the importance of this, this mm. in relation to class politics or race in relation to class mm. politics was something we were working out how to do. Yes, indeed. So, I'm not, you know, it isn't a surprise to me that I didn't write very much about that. Mm. It's not so much of a surprise to me, but a regret. Mm. that, you know, people who were older and more sophisticated at that stage than I was, like Raymond mm. and Edward Thompson, mm. couldn't see yeah. that this was 
changing. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. They couldn't see what the emergence of a black politics was. Mm -hmm. Well, people say, you know, this is because they're too English. They were too English. No question about that. <laughs> you know, I was the only black person on the editorial board of New Left Review. Mm -hmm. The only black person. Mm -hmm. you know, my, you know, symbolic father, you know, Edward Thompson, yeah. uh, um, Raymond Williams, um, Ralph Miliband, mm. you know, uh, um, you know, these are Peter Worsley, mm. John Rex, you know, mm. these were, you know, very experienced people. They were interested in imperialism, they were mm -hmm. very anxious about imperialism, mm. but they were not, they didn't understand that the black presence within Britain mm. would be a transformatory presence, that it was going to expand, yeah. that it was part of the first tip of a wave which mm. was going to follow in mm. much expanded numbers after. In the seat was a change of conjuncture. Do they, uh, do, you have, do you have a sense of... Imagine what they... <laughs> I know you can't imagine yourself to that time, but it really was like that. I mean, you know, it may have been that I could have been more articulate about it. Mm. You have to remember also that having just taken the decision to stay, mm. you know, I was thinking about something else, really. Mm. I was thinking about, well, you're going to be here. What's your accommodation with here? What is mm. in relation to British politics? What's mm. in relation to British class? Mm. questions, etc. Yeah. So my mind was slightly somewhere else. Mm. You know? And I guess people can't now imagine yes. a black intellectual whose mind was somewhere else mm. until you think about C.L.R. James. Yes. You know, C.L.R. was always conscious of race. Mm. But he wasn't, you know, he wasn't articulating a, an indigenous, an authentic, independent black politics mm. relating to Britain. He was, you know, Trotskyist. He was a Trot. He was mm. one of the finest speakers. Rock Huston, who I used to live with, mm. you know, told me he'd never heard anybody like speak in public like C.L.R. James. Mm. Speaking for the ILP. Mm. You know, he wasn't addressing, you know, a crowd of black people. No. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I so, do, yeah. And, and now, uh, having discovered uh, the degree to which James was always thinking about that, the fact is, the Marxist has got lost. Yes. No, nobody wants to talk about that anymore. No. So I just think that, you know, I, I think it's a mess, really, mm. to be absolutely honest. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah? I think it's. I think it's, a, it's so much that needs disentangling. Yes. And I suppose the most important thing I would say about it is, if you have a historical imagination, you have to transport yourself to the moment you are writing about, and what it is like to be interior to it, to live, you know. It inside. Mm. There's no point asking, you know, uh, um, you know, why wasn't she a feminist mm. you know, yeah. in the 17th century? Now, excuse me. Yeah. You know, it's had nothing to do with whether women weren't yeah. oppressed and exploited, or whether there wasn't, as there wasn't the 17th yeah. century already, a small consciousness of women who yeah. thought they would have to struggle to be independent, or a large number of women who talked about marriage as a form of slavery. But by the time you get to Wollstonecraft, etc. But, you know, it, it's not quite, you can't just say, why weren't they feminist? Mm, no. In the same way as you can't really say about, black poli about British politics in the 50s, mm. why wasn't it black? Mm. Okay? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, now, I want to separate that, you know, from were particular people at fault? Mm. Was I not mm. sufficiently involved and committed? Mm. Couldn't I carry the argument with mm. with those people? Were they blind to it? All mm. of those things are true. Yeah, no, no, sure. Do you think? I, I sometimes think, you know, I also think of Hunslet, you know, and 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 what was happening in those northern towns as well. I mean, another book that I really love, actually. But, yeah. Um, yeah. For all kinds of reasons, you know. Yes. Uh, um, for his, but um, do you think it's to do with the kind of priorities and commitments that? Hoggart and Williams and Thompson had that they were kind of, I sometimes felt you know that obviously for Williams that border landscape yeah. is such a primal kind yeah. of place to think not yeah. not unlike your you know Kennington's yeah. classroom but yeah. Yeah. and for Hoggart yeah. I mean uh, you know Yorkshire yeah Hunslet is the same mm. that kind of respectable industrial working class landscape mm. is back of his head yeah. all the time, yeah, yeah. all the time, yeah, yeah. no matter how elevated he eventually became. Yes, indeed. Yeah.
though on the one hand that furnishes a kind of imagination but it also forecloses I suppose yeah it always does it yeah. always does yeah. yeah it does both yeah it makes possible insights uh, if you can't really get any other way because mm. you it takes you deep and close and it takes you emotionally as well mm. as analytically and it takes you subjectively as mm. well as objectively mm. so there's certain kinds of insights you can't gain without that mm. but it means the furniture of your mind is sort of set it's a beautiful and, it. I think it's so true. You know, what can you do about that I, w I want to try and pull us a bit closer to to, to now, but um, yeah. um, uh, I, I suppose one of the things I thought was very it was very suggestive to me reading your your work was the idea that you know the bridge between class or the connection between class and race say was a, could be a matter of you know the modality through which other things are expressed. So the idea that you know that race was the modality through which class was being yes. experienced was yes. a very suggestive and powerful. Yes. One to me. Yeah, um, and I know other people for whom it is. I mean, that comes out of the work on policing the crisis yes, of in the seventies, yeah. and you know, it was a way of rethinking what in the fifties would have been seen as two quite separate mm. things: mm. Yeah, uh, race and class. Mm. Um, w would I say it now? Well, I would also want to remind people that. Class is the way in which race is lived. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Once you get into globalization, yeah. and you know the working class is people earning one dollar a day in Calcutta. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. class is lived through race, and race is lived through class. Mm. So they're two interdependent, not exactly the same. Mm. The mistake earlier was to try to collapse them together. Yes. If you solve the class question, mm. you would, of course, solve the other question. Yeah. So when uh, uh, Edward Thompson responded to policing the crisis by saying, what's all the stuff about class? Mm. He didn't mean that race is about race. He didn't mean that race was unimportant. Mm. But he meant that once you once you get rid of capitalism, the yeah. race question will, of course, solve itself. Because, of course, we all are against imperialism. You know, my father was a friend of Tagore's. Mm. My house was full of Indian national, as indeed it was. Mm. You know, it isn't a figure as a political question which yeah. somebody involved in British class politics could ask directly. Yes. That was a limitation, a severe limitation, but that was what the consciousness, you know, was like. Yeah. So now we're in another conjunction. Mm. And yeah. we're through the conjuncture in well, I mean we're through that extremely important moment when race, class and gender emerge as overlapping but distinct formations. Yes, indeed. I was struck by that comment that Orwell made about the British working class, most of whom don't live in Britain. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean I wanted to ask you about police in the crisis, um because um just Reading it again and thinking about it again, it's, it, it's so much a book about f f the damage of fe the fear does. Or, you know, about of the dam fear. Oh uh, yeah. Fear and and the damage that it does in a society um, like uh, um, this one, um, and it made me think about you know how enduring that those fears have become yeah. and shifting at the same time. Yeah. Um, I know that you've you've written, you wrote about that specifically in. in yeah. Um, well, I think it was particularly acute in the 70s, you know, because um, one could see uh, uh, a, an unconscious or subconscious set of feelings mm. being released in relation to race. Which is not released in relation to anything else. Yeah. yeah. I mean, of course, you know, some people might have hated the working class, or hated the organizing the labor movement, etc. Yeah. But the hatred about race was visceral. Yeah. Yeah. And it had to do with some with things like otherness. Mm -hmm. It had to do with you know people say uh, that color is you know they think about racism in terms of skin color. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't think that's really the right way to think about it, though skin color matters. Mm. In that period, it mattered profoundly. Yeah? Mm. It mattered as a line of difference. These are other than us. Yeah. 
Yeah, they don't belong to us. They don't come out of ourselves. It was a real, you know, a massive historical denial of Britain's responsibility in relation to imperialism over mm. 400 years. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, it was there. Yes. Yeah? I, I think of Mary Douglas, you know. Mm. you know. What is it but matter out of place? There it is, matter out of place. And they thought they were dirty. Mm. They were because they were fouling up our space. Mm. You know, I said to somebody who was making a radio program about Powell. Mm. You know, Powell adored India. Yes. He's almost a sort of classic Orientalist. Yes. It was a wonderful, rich civilization. Yeah. He just thought none of them should be here. Yeah, exactly. Not yeah. here, not in my backyard. Yeah, yeah. You know, not yeah. uh, living in houses, you know, disporting their pig and it's in my street. Yeah. But in Delhi or in, you know, it's such a, of course, wonderful people. Yeah. yeah. You know, so. You know, I, I guess I read, we wrote about fear because we were aware of the, these unconscious, yeah. you know, Paul writes about it too, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, the kind of unrequited roots yeah. of racism yeah. in British culture. Yeah. Doesn't mean everybody is racist, no. doesn't mean there are no anti-racist white people, you yeah. know, it doesn't mean any of those things. No. But this culture does partly live off a reservoir of unconscious feelings about race. Yeah. And in particular, those feelings remain unconscious because they're about race. Yeah. It's difficult for them to ex get expressed yeah. somehow. Yeah. Yeah? So, you know, of course you need equal opportunities. Mm. Of course you need, you know, <laughs> mm. legal uh, and a defense of mm. people's rights. Of course, you need people to be punished if they incite violence, etc. Mm. How you get to the core of the subconscious roots of English racism, I don't know. No. But what we were aware of in the 70s is that this was spiraling up yeah. as a kind of fear. Yeah. And remember that in the 70s they're also afraid about all sorts of other things. They're afraid about young people, yeah. they're afraid about hedonism, yeah. they're afraid about the explosion of sexuality on the streets, yeah. they're afraid about drugs and, you know, uh, ter tune in, turn on, tune in and drop out, mm. you know, they're ex afraid about student riots, mm. they're afraid about the anti viet you know, the hydra-headed other <laughs> yeah. Yeah, was stalking the fields of Britain. And a lot of people that we were reading in the press and in the p political spokespeople really spoke about it like that. Hailsham spoke about yeah, you yeah. know, We think it's just one thing, but it's not. Everything is sort of out of control. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's, 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 you, and, and you can go from one thing to another. Yeah. It's a kind of entirely symptomatic reading of this. Because the race problem is only symptomatic of the violence problem. It's only symptomatic of the drug problem. You know, yeah. everything is symptomatic of something else. Yeah. That is why uh, you know, in policing the crisis, we felt um, we felt justified in calling it a crisis, yes. because it was seen as a crisis. Yeah, you know, as yeah. a breakdown of the whole society, and you don't really you don't understand um, mm. Powell's speech until you understand it. it comes out of that. Yeah, it comes out of that vision. But all of the, a number of those, well, at least two of them, and the resistance to rituals too, seem, you yeah. know, I mean, I think it's sometimes people forget actually how involved you were yeah. really with that, with the different aspects oh, yeah. of that hydra, oh, if yeah. you like, oh, yes. of thinking about that. Yes. Uh, no, no, uh, of course. Uh, well, you know, in some ways, the break, the break in English culture begins there. Mm. You know, it begins with mm. television, it begins mm. with youth culture. Mm. It does begin with rock around the clock. In a funny <laughs> kind of way. You know, those of us who went to rock around the clock just knew that yeah. something is happening here, yeah. <laughs> which sure. if it gets loose, yeah. <laughs> it leaves the Odeon <laughs> 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 and starts to take root out there. You yeah. know, will unhinge. You know, the British stoicism, the mm. tight ass, tight mm. <laughs> upper lip. Mm class, whatever that is, mm. repression, mm. you know, it will just unpack that from the inside, and so it has done, mm, yeah. so it has done. Uh, I was also, I wanted uh, to ask you about, I mean, I know that you, you, you've, you've written a couple of times about, you know, uh, scepticism about revolutionary movements that move everything in a, yeah. few, in a few days, 
and I've argued with lots of people about this because um, I think you're onto something when you talk about this notion of multicultural drift. Yes. The accumulation of small yep. things. And I just wanted to ask you a little bit about that and how you see that from that moment, I suppose, that crisis. It's a long, it's a long, yeah, a long drift, if you like, to now. But yeah. Well, I mean, the two two things you're asking me about, really. The first is about my relationship to revolutionary movements. Mm. You know, of course, um, I know there have been revolutions. Mm. I know that there are circumstances in which there is nothing to do but have a revolution. Yes. If only, you know, one could have a revolution tomorrow in Burma. Mm. Well, you know, it needs it. Yeah. <laughs> it owes itself a yeah. major, yeah. you know, splurge. Really. Mm. Um, so that's not my that's not my concern. Although I have never myself been in, into revolutionary politics very much, mm. and that's because you know the Caribbean became independent without you know without a anti-imperial struggle, mm. whereas you know, Kenya, yeah. uh, you know, of course. Uh, uh, Burma, you know, so on mm. did not, mm. you know. Uh, and I came, got involved in British class politics. Well, you know, British class politics, just, I'm sorry, friends, is not a revolutionary formation. Would no. that it were in some it respect, were but it ain't, you know. Mm. So one has a more difficult task mm. of understanding how class politics really work and mm. how class reconciliation works and how class enmity and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very, it's not without questions of class, mm. but it just doesn't, it's not pointing towards a ex single explosive moment. Yeah. Well, um, is that just because of the milieu in which I've had to think? I think not only. It mm. is because of the two revolutionary moments which to which uh, my politics are very much related. One is the Russian Revolution mm. and the other is the Cuban Revolution. Yeah. Okay? And the Re Russian Revolution, I knew, was not the beginning of year one. Mm. Yes, it was not Thermidor. It was not mm. start again from the, from the beginning. Mm. Yeah. Only to look at what happened on Stalinism, yeah. to see the vengeance with the past wreaked on mm. the present. Mm. You know? mm. Just to see things which could not be undone, which you know the attempt to the drastic attempt to drive society in some other direction simply could not get away from mm. the grip of a long authoritarian political culture, yeah. for instance. Yeah. And the Cuban Revolution, well, of course, I was more excited about the Cuban Revolution. I went to Cuba a year after it happened. Mm. And I thought it was incredible, you know, coming down the stairs of that plane into a tropical airport, which had just had a revolution. <laughs> I thought, you know, this is Jamaica. It could happen <laughs> just there, you know, etc. But, um, what is, and you know, also I think that there are many achievements of that revolution mm. which have to be defended. Mm. But what it isn't is the start again from the yeah. beginning. I just think if you have a sort of historical cast in mind, I'm not a historian, but the, the, the notion of conjunction, historical specificity, mm. gives my thinking and writing a certain ever present historical cast. Yeah. And if you have a historical cast of mine, mm. it, it just aren't persuaded mm. that everything, mm. everything would, can start again from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah? Yes, and I don't really believe in origins of that kind. I don't believe in origins culturally, yeah. I don't believe in them in terms of identity, and I don't believe in them in terms of politics. Yeah. Well, you said at the beginning when we were talking about, you know, in a sense, the kind of the, the dynamism of black British, a life, black British life has been your kind of, one of your sort of touchstones. And, yes. And, and, and I just, in a sense, your kind of writing life, intellectual life, has kind of run parallel with that, with yeah. that yeah. sort of, you know... It's what I've been thinking about. It's what you've been thinking about. It is my subject, you know. Yes. Uh, yes, it's not my, the topic that I've written about. Yeah. But it is my subject. Yes. Insofar as it's written with lives and experiences in mind, yeah. it's written to a kind of imaginary audience, yeah. and so far as new questions are seen through the prism of an experience which arises from yeah. that, it's my subject. Yeah. It's not what I've always written about. No, no. I don't know what to, to call it. It's not my topics, 
but it is my subject in a sort of some other yeah. way. Yeah, well, it's a very, it, you know, it's a really profound way to describe it, actually, yeah. I think. But yeah, when you use that notion of multicultural drift, ah, yeah. you see, I, I, that's, that got, anyway, what do you Well, think? you know, of course, I don't, you know, don't misunderstand the term. I don't mean that there's nothing to much multiculturalism but it's drift, right. you know, uh, without anti-racist politics, yeah. you know, without re the resistance to racism at the local level, yeah. you know, without a change of consciousness among black people, yeah. no multiculturalism of any kind. Yeah. It's really a, an idea from the other side, you know, well, mm -hmm. uh, things are not going so well, really, you mm -hmm. know, there hasn't been a profound change in yeah. British society, we haven't got to the deep level of yes, racism in the culture that I think throbs on. Yeah. Well, there's nothing changed. Mm. Yes, something has changed. Mm. What has changed is you go into the street, and you know I came here in 1951, and it just looks different. Mm. Britain will never go back to being a homogenous cultural, culturally homogenous society mm. ever again. Yeah. It can't. I mean, it can have purges, yeah. can throw people out into the sea, yeah. but it can't go back to being you know, stable and steady on its own monocultural foundations. Yes. Can't happen. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, I want to say multicultural drift is sort of all, we've, it's what we've had to, get, to be getting on with. Yeah. You know, at least this is the thing that's not in their control. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't, unfortunately, it doesn't lead to or underpin a very active black politics, mm -hmm. which as you know has sort of declined since mm -hmm. the eighties. Mm -hmm. In a way. Eighty and eighty five mm -hmm. were the last moments. Yeah. You know, of a really big black conscious mm -hmm. political movement. Yeah. Do you, do you, do you have a sense of why why that's why is is one connected to the other? The, the in the sense that the, the, the multicultural drift isn't it? Uh, you know, it's good people don't like the word drift. You see? Yeah, you see, politics must be conscious, you know, etc. And I think that too. Yeah. But if you don't succeed in making a move, uh, 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 making a movement, yeah, do things stop? Do they not change? No, they don't. Well, <laughs> they con continue to change incrementally. Mm. You know, and that is the those that is the raw materials out of which another politics will emerge at some later moment so yeah. you better attend to it mm. you know? mm. it's not you know it's not bob marley it's not kids in the street you know with afros it's not mm. rastafarianism you know it's not black consciousness it's not black is beautiful mm. it's a much more ambiguous world yeah. but does that mean it's it's uh, it's impact on the wider society has halted. It has not. Yes, They've indeed. not been able to halt it. Uh -huh. It's un unraveling. Yeah. <laughs> Very slowly unraveling. And I call that sort of movement, Gramsci called it a passive revolution. Yeah. Yes, it's a passive revolution. Mm. Fortunately, so. But passive revolutions happen. Mm. You know, it happens more incrementally. Mm. I mean, what I, have, I like and admire about it is the idea that they are small incremental, accumulative, cumulative, yeah. no going back kind of change. Yeah, that's, I, think, yeah, that's I, what I uh, think that is so. That's yeah. what, I, what I was trying to capture the term. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. So it wasn't by in any means a recommendation that you should work for drift. No. You should have to work for something, <laughs> that's away for something drift, more yeah. serious and yeah. more wide re ranging and deep reaching, yeah. far reaching than that. Yeah. Well, some of our friends and my, and my friends have said, you know, well, you there are things that make the current move faster, and that's what you have to focus on. Of course. On. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But when that is not around, what yeah. Marx called the old mole, <laughs> the old black mole is still <laughs> wor working along working. down there, <laughs> on weaving its way through in the bowels, you know, from yeah. looking for another way out. Sure. Several times in, in your writing, you, you talk about the way, how important it is for that black presence in Britain to or there the, to be understandings and representations that are recognisable, that in some ways make sense um, yeah. of, that, of that conjuncture, of that predicament, if you like, of those yeah, um, um, yeah, I think that's very important. And in some ways it's because, uh, you know, if you move towards, if your analysis moves towards the level of the conjunctural, 
Mm. You have to take a much wider range of phenomena into mm. account. Mm. You, know? uh, you can't just rest with the underlying logic. Mm. You know? uh, and so you're, um, I don't know, y you think about what is, uh, what is likely to awaken identification. Yeah. No politics without identification. Mm. You know, people have to invest something of mm. them in something that they recognize is of them or speaks to their condition. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And without that moment of recognition, you, you can, politics also has a drift. So politics will go on, yeah. but you won't have a political movement yeah. Yeah, without that moment of identification. Yeah. So of course it matters to me profoundly you know, what strikes the popular imaginary, what mm. strikes that, you know, what is not necessarily a political theory or political mm. doctrine, but what appeals to the imaginary and in the imaginary unlocks something yeah. which isn't usually unlocked uh, yeah. elsewhere. Yeah. You know, I once said about popular culture, which is, you know, I've been an aficionado yeah. of, from ever since, yeah. <laughs> and still am. Mm -hmm. you know? I must be the only middle class view of neighbors left <laughs> <laughs> you know, on earth. You know? So I'm still am addicted to mm. parts of popular culture. But I said once about it, you know, it's only what is at stake in the popular that makes it worthwhile. Yeah. Otherwise, who gives a shit about it? Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, it's of no you know, it's not of any importance. And yeah. also, it's just an inventory. This is popular culture, that is high culture. Now here, here is a bit of popular culture moving into, you know. Yeah, yeah. That, who cares about that? Yeah. What matters is where the, the, Im, the popular imaginary yeah. gets itself expressed. And, yeah. where, and it does not always get expressed in high culture. It no. gets expressed in the dirty, compromised, yeah. you know, commercialized, overridden world of popular culture. Yeah. Which is never an uncontradictory uncont space, never an uncontested space, the sure. popular. Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah, so one must attend to it. No. <laughs> well, I guess as well, you know, there's no sense of what popular culture is in this in this context without a black presence. Oh no, it's, of course, it's impossible to yeah. think it now. Uh, well, which is you know, that that's part of you know, that's part of. Of course, that is so, and it's so. Politically, mm. that's why I said today I would mm. say class is lived through the modality of race in the same mm. way as race is lived through the modality of class. Mm. That's what has happened. Mm. But it is that is so that is true of any kind of politics you can think of. Yeah. But even if you didn't, the signs of the black presence are all around us. Yeah. So there isn't a you know there may be less of a black presence yeah. movement. Yeah. yeah, there's an affirmation yeah. of black consciousness, yeah. but it, it, it's there, you of know, course. how could you look at popular culture, popular life, how could you look at the cities, yeah, yeah. how could you look at football, how could you look at popular music, yeah. you know, how could you look at any of those spheres, how could yeah. you look at the NHS? Indeed. You know, <laughs> well, this for is goodness so sake, I, you know, I go to dialysis three times a week. It's like a cross-section of multicultural drift. If you want to see multicultural drift, come with me, you know, on a Thursday <laughs> to the diocese unit of St. Charles Hospital. You yeah. will see it. You will see it, I tell you. Oh, yes. Oh, it's very live in my mind, too, Stuart, for all kinds of other reasons, which are not important for us to talk about now. But exactly, the hospital yeah, the as hospital. a place to think. The hospital, absolutely. Of those I do questions. love my thinking there. I tell yeah. you. So, you know, what sustains the black presence? Well, it's sustained in all sorts of ways. Mm. And there's no reason to give up hope because it's not at the high political pitch that it was in the 80s, mm. you know, not at the high level of political mm. consciousness. The problem, you know, is really not so much going back to that, but trying to imagine what that might be in the next decade, in the next yeah. conjuncture. Sure. Yeah? How will these informal presences, which are so important, mm. come together in another moment yeah. to create another kind of black or whatever, multicultural politics? Yeah, no, sure. We don't have a moment to, to imagine that yet. I mean, no, no. we don't have the capacity to imagine that yet. No, no, no. But still, that is the question. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a question. So, you know, the sustainers of that black presence, yeah. you know, what is happening in them? including a lot of contradictory things, you know. Yeah. I mean, what is happening to black young people, young boys especially, 
is completely horrendous, yeah. completely horrendous. Mm. And I have to confess to you that one of the reasons for it, or one of the things which contains it, is precisely black popular culture. Mm. Yeah. Mm. As a aficionado of black pop, yeah. <laughs> popular culture, you know, it gives me the deep pain to have to say it, but it does say it. It mm. gives young black people another world of recognition which they're not going to find in the everyday world. They're not going to find through academic success. They're mm. not going to find through... Some of them have, of course. Mm. That's one of the, thing, mm. the things that's happened in multiculturalism. Mm. Yeah? Some people have made it. Mm. Some black people make it much more than they ever have before. Mm. And some by dint of very hard work. For instance, mm. a lot of women at the bottom of the social work and mm. medical professions, etc., mm. have studied, brought up their children on their own. You know, they are really lived a heroic life in this mm. period. Mm. But not everybody can do that. Mm. And an alternative has been offered to them mm. in certain aspects mm. of you know, what we used to be quite romantic about, drop out. Mm. You know. Yeah, that's okay. Mm. But uh, um, lives are being lost. Lives are being sacrificed. Indeed. I mean, there's no easy way to speak about that, is no, there? It's, it's, um, it's almost, I find it almost impossible to speak about. Yeah. But at the same the, time... The, the terrain of the dialogue is so, you know, horrendously skewed yeah. that one can't can hardly talk about it at all. Yeah. But I, I mourn it yeah. every day. No, indeed. I mean, I, I think of it in those spaces that I'm close to and people that I'm close to as well of those young lives damaging themselves, actually Absolutely. damaging people damaging who are the mirror image of themselves. themselves. And damaging other people just like them. Yeah. No, true. Um, I want, wanted to ask you about our kind of, um, to, to end with really, because we've talked for a long time, um, um, about our current conjuncture, I suppose. There's been an awful lot of talk about the death of multiculture and death of multiculturalism. Yeah. Yeah. And when, when do you think uh, this isn't a lovely question, really. But um, I mean, do, do you think that the the current our current conjuncture begins, as so many say, with you know September 11th and all of that stuff? Or do you do you th is that do you think that is a beginning of something of the a beginning of the now, say, or is, have you got another sense of of where we are at this point? Uh, well, uh, in pure conjunctural terms, but this is you know. It's just speculation. Mm. Um, I think the present conjuncture begins in the mid-70s. Mm. Yeah? The Thatcherism is the first installment of it. Right. It's really about globalization. Yeah. So, uh, you know, all the things to do with this world and that world, with the other hair, with asylum, mm. with waves of migration, with people thrown out of their homes, with you know, people living in transit camps, all of that stuff is the underside of globalization, in my view. Yeah. Yeah? Globalization is how capital uh, saved itself from the welfare state. Yeah. Yeah, once it realized it hadn't, couldn't directly roll back the welfare state, yeah. it had to go somewhere else to yeah. increase its capacity to exploit labor yeah. and abroad. That's yeah. where it went. Yeah. You know, overseas growth, the division of labor between the office in Manhattan and the dollar a day worker in Indonesia, you know, etc. Okay, you know. And I I happen to think that uh, that this phase of Muslim in extremism, or really of the politicization of Islam, mm. is part of that phenomenon too. Yeah. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Which is, you know, not to say it doesn't have religious roots and not mm. to say it doesn't it takes another step up at the moment of uh, the suicide bomber and terrorism and mm. all that. On the other hand, it takes a step right backwards in terms of <laughs> occupying other people's countries. Yes. Which is so old and ancient yeah. that apparently the Brits and the Americans don't even recognize it. They don't see why they're seen in that way. No. You know, they can't imagine why they're seen in that way. They mm. came to save them. This is, you know, this, this is the oldest mm. imperialist story there mm. ever has been. We're here, you know, to, for the white man's burden. Mm. But still, I think it has a lot to do with that. 
Now I think about Islam. Mm. I think about the possibility of Islamic nationalism. Mm. I think about the moment of Islamic socialism. Mm. Yeah, uh, you know, all of them exhausted one after another mm. yeah, in the Cold War and in the period after that. Mm. What is left as a way of identifying yourself? But religion. Mm. Unfortunately, this is a move to the regressive side of the political spectrum. Yeah. It's performing a lot of the same functions yeah. as these other movements performed late at an earlier stage. Yeah. So, and I happen to think that, you know, we say it's really, you know, being driven by young people, young people on the, in the, on the street. Mm. Why are they as poor as they are? Why do they feel hemmed in by Mm. you know, by so many constraints. Why is it that they can't recognize themselves in the modern world? Well, because of the way in which the division of labor in global capitalist society mm. does, you know, make them the objects rather than the subjects of economic development. Yeah. So I think there are these underlying things. Yeah, that's mm. why I hesitate to say 9-11 mm. came out of the blue. Yeah. We don't know where it came from, yeah. you know. Suddenly everything has changed. You can recognize in that my way of simplifying it, yeah. all the things I wouldn't like. Yeah? Yeah. Didn't come out of the blue. No, no, Been sure. on the history books since there. Yeah. We only left Iraq in 1992 yeah. when we were driven out. You know, 1892 when we were driven out. You know, it's not very long ago since we were there. No. Um, uh, and so on. Mm. You know? um, we signed the, uh, uh, you know, we colluded in the formation of a religiously exclusive state in Palestine mm. at the expense of driving Palestinians into camps around about. Mm. Nothing is from, in, in the Middle East, is from the day before yesterday. No. Nothing. No, no. Of course, that's not to say it remains the same. No. This is a new phase, yeah. and it's a phase particularly for people on the left because mm of religion, the mm. ambiguous situation of religion, mm. because we've never understood religion, and because our secular sociological selves thought mm. it was going to go away, exactly. you know, and because, you know, communism and those socialist movements were all secular movements, etc. Mm. So culture has taken its revenge on our failure to understand the history. Mm. So, of course, I, I, you know, in one sort of way, I feel, well, we'll never be the same again. And mm. I think we may never be. Mm. But I wouldn't myself identify the conjunctural shift there. Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah? I yeah. identify it as another place. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose in a way, identifying it there enables the f an, an easy forgetting or an erasure of what's going on. Yes, I think that it involves precisely that. Yeah? And I think it involves America precisely yeah. for, you know, to, to um, absolve themselves of a long historical responsibility yes. which has been going on since the beginning of the 19th century. Yeah, yeah. 20th century. Yeah. Um, just a, a, a couple of things to end with, really. Um, and the f first one is about the, the way you, you, you periodize the conjuncture of Thatcherism. And you, you've said many times that New Labour has been a historic missed opportunity. Um, I think it's a missed opportunity, yes, but uh, do you, it is the second phase of Thatcher's, really, <laughs> really, really, that's what it is. You know? So it's a missed opportunity only because it would have had to do something just as dramatic as Thatcherism mm. to have found a counter-politics. Mm. Yeah? And that's what you know, those of us on the left kept mm. saying. You aren't going back to na the nationalization of everything inside. Mm. You aren't going back to the old style labor movement. Mm. It is being, you know, decentered and distributed around the world by global capitalism. You know, the way is not to go back. The way is to go forward. Mm. And it is to try to redefine what your hopes were of that form of liberation mm. and of that kind of equality mm. in the new conditions. That requires a lot of hard thought, not sentimentality. Yeah. And the thought never happened. The thought was, how do we accommodate this? Yes. Yeah? Yeah. That's what Giddens taught them. Globalization is irreversible. What can you, you can do is accommodate to it. Improve the supply side, build up the skills, make Britain more competitive, you know, open the doorway to trade, uh, lower the barriers to invest, you know, etc. Mm -hmm. Make mm -hmm. globalization work. Mm -hmm. And the surprise to me is, of course, that uh, social democracy has been more successful than that, 
than Thatcherism was. Because it attends to the poor, you know, it mm. attends to those who are residually left mm. out, mm. you know, it doesn't want to dismantle it, whereas Thatcherism drove, you know, yeah. it didn't give a damn about anybody, it was just driving this through the society, etc. Mm. Mm. And the end of Thatcherism is really an interesting moment for me, mm. because nobody quite explained why it happened. Yeah. You know, the Conservatives didn't, you know, you know they adore her. Yes. They think she's the most wonderful leader they've had since Churchill. Yes. So why did they get rid of her? You know, there's some sense that you can't do this just like that, that the costs, are, yeah. that what's falling apart is a consequence of this, you know. Yeah, yeah. So they sort of move more to the middle terrain. Okay, you know, a bit of, you know, good governance, yeah, yeah. etc. So I see, you know, it's, you know, it's not just swearing. Mm. You know? If you are talking about a long-term political project, essentially the neoliberal global capitalist project, mm. new labor, is a more successful <laughs> installment of it than the first installment, which yeah. is Thatcher's. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And as you know, I wrote a lot about Thatcher's. Mm. Much of it was to try to persuade the left to take it seriously. Yes, it's indeed. not just a turn of the electoral screw, and mm. that it's much deeper movements going on in that didn't, you know, it didn't, I was going to say, it didn't uh, catch fire. Mm. But actually, some people heard it. The oh, wrongs, sure, absolutely. The wrong side heard it. Yeah. The Blairites heard it and thought, oh, yes, this is inevitable. We've yeah. got to adapt it. Yes. But what, uh, what I was going to say was that I was preoccupied with the impact of that on Britain. Mm. I saw the sort of relationship to Reaganism mm. broadly. Mm. I didn't see its global impact. It was a global moment, not mm. a national moment. Mm -hmm. It paraded under the nationalist guise, mm -hmm. you know, British values, mm -hmm. um, you know, the flag for the Falklands, you mm -hmm. know, send the gunboat, etc. Mm -hmm. But that's just, you know, Marx's notion that the future comes masqueraded like the past. <laughs> it was a masquerade. Mm -hmm. you know? What is happening underneath is much deeper, more transformed. Very last thing, Stuart. Um, um, I, 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 I know that you've used an occasion, the idea from Althusser of the importance of bending the bending the twig, yep. bending the bending uh, the twig, yes. bending the twig. Um, and I suppose some of the ideas uh, that that you have helped to shape some of the debates here have been have had their successes, and people have rested from them. I think you know about the new ethnicities in science yep. and some of those kinds of um, uh, ideas where people miss the conjunctural. Yes. Um, often, I think, um, but. Um, I just wondered where, how you think we need to bend the twig now, in terms of what you've described, um, and what, what, what the questions, which way, what kind of things do we need to bend the twig towards uh, and away from? You've mentioned religion and, and a number of other things. Is it just an impossible question to answer? No, I mean, I'm just, you know, I think, I mean, if, if I were more certain, I would have written more about it. Uh, so, uh, uh, this is a very tentative mm. answer, um, and it will reveal how, you know, old-fashioned I am. <laughs> we need to bend the twig in the direction of understanding the full outcome of the new phase of global capitalism. You know, and that is about difference, it's about, you know, why the question of difference is so you know, so much on the table, it's mm. why uh, um, religion has made a return, it's mm. why, you know, half the world feels as if it's, well, half the world has become the proletariat of the other half, mm. you know, it's why so many people are left out, it's why mm. Africa is in such a terrible, disastrous state, mm. you know, on and on and on. Mm. Uh, so, that is not enough, mm. you know, lots of things follow on from that. Mm. but. If you ask me in terms of how I would intervene yes, mm. in any yes, discussion going on, I'll intervene to remind them of the global dimensions of what is going on. Yeah, yeah? So whereas 20 years ago I would intervene in relation to questions of blackness yeah. in terms of race, I would intervene now, not forgetting race at all, no. but intervene in the, in the direction of questions of difference. Yeah, yeah. Because it seems like, in the one sense, you know, that that where that intervention it obviously 
is a it, well, well points us towards what's happening at, at the, you know they're kind of the border questions where which just seems to be to yes. in a sense to be like a kind of a, a nightmare that's yeah. happening yeah, to our you know yes. there are the things that I, I care about in terms of Britishness and yes. the way it's shifted yeah. and yes. and some of the domestic shifts around race and racism which yes. I think um you know I, I wouldn't say proud of but yes. I think are something to care about yes. but the hardening of the border Oh, yeah. And the keeping of those people, the, the, the open hand being shown to those people, seems to speak to something. Yeah, that you're I pointing think, to you us. Know, you asked me earlier on, and I didn't reply to you, whether I think that's what's going on, and I do. I think the so called declared death of multiculturalism is a route back to assimilationism. And assimilationism is a new way of dealing with difference because it doesn't say you can't be here. Mm. <laughs> that's that is soul. Mm. It, it might say only some of you can be here, or not too many of you can be here. And mm. that's what we're going to see. Mm. Okay? It can't say none of you, but it mm. says if you're here, you must look and behave like us. Yeah. Yeah. You must, in other words, liquidate all those differences that you know meant anything to you. Yeah. 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 All you have to erase them. Yeah. Yeah and become like us. And if you become deeply black English, you know, some of you can stay. Yeah. That's a new accommodation. Yeah, yeah. It's not quite the Powell moment. No. Well, I guess they did think they could send us all home. No, no. You know, <laughs> the agents of global capitalism didn't understand that the <laughs> capitalists were not going to send anybody, you know, home. Yeah. They wanted to play with, you know, I would go into that, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, okay? of course. Yeah. So, uh, um, I do think that questions of, uh, I do think that that the crises that appear now appear in very different forms. You, you talked about the closure of the border. Mm. Okay. I, I'm, you know, I'm transfixed by people displaced from their homes. Mm. You know, thousands and thousands, millions of people across the mm. world mm. who are living in transit camps or mm. in, you know. E UNICEF Council, you know, who 